A Sudan analyst is calling on African leaders in the international community to wake up to the human rights and regional security challenges posed by the conflict in Sudan. Suleiman Baldo, director of the Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker, says the international community should rise to the challenge and not abandon the people of Sudan. This comes as Rapid Support Forces RSF leader Mohamed Hamdan Daglo Hemeti has been touring several African countries, expressing his willingness for an unconditional ceasefire. Baldo tells me that instead of treating Hemeti as a statesman, African leaders should put maximum pressure, including sanctions, on him and Sudan military leader General Abdel Fattah al burhan he is uh, trying to establish some legitimacy for himself as a statesman and is being given that uh, opportunity by heads uh, of states and governments in Africa for their own reasons. I don't know why, because he is the head of a genocidal uh, militia that is wreaking havoc in Sudan. It's a uh, well-established record of mass atrocities, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, it's well-established and uh, independently reported. So I don't know why uh, African heads of state are giving uh, the man uh, all this presidential reception and uh, recognition. I don't see it as necessary for getting him to a uh, negotiating table. On the contrary, they should have dealt with him without uh, according him that recognition. But could it be perhaps that uh, Africa is tired of the killing and the war in Sudan and uh, they are willing to accept at least uh, a peaceful resolution? Well, you get a peaceful recognition by, uh, you know, avoiding to give recognition and legitimacy to those who are committing the killings and the atrocities. Both uh, the head of the army and the head of the rapid support forces are responsible for the destruction of Sudan and the uprooting of its population. And they, they should not be given that legitimacy by the international community. And in the fairest order of things, they should not be given that legitimacy by the African heads of state and, and governments. But how do you bring about peace without the heads of the warring parties? You put maximum pressure on them. You deny them recognition. You impose uh, economic embargoes on them. This is how you do it. And you do it as part of a regional and international uh, integrated uh, coordinated strategy. I noticed that uh, the military leader, Burhan, has also rejected what Dagalo is doing. Yes, he, he was uh, sort of uh, irritated by the reception uh, Dagalo has received, and uh, now he's saying he's no longer interested. Having agreed to this meeting, what happened is that in between, Pemeti has surfaced and began this regional tour and received all this uh, official uh, recognition from several member states of the IGAD, you know, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Djibouti. He, he has been to all these states and was received, uh, you know, as a, a statesman. And that's why, that's a major uh, reason why, uh, you know, Burhan is today is no longer interested in meeting, negotiating a solution. I don't think this is the right attitude. But it's a response and an angry response, I think, to the uh, reception that Himeti has received. From where you sit, do you think uh, some movement is being made towards peace? At uh, this time, you know, the, the, there was a window of opportunity, as they said, by the invitation of the IGAD for this summit between Burhan and Himeti. This window appeared to have been uh, closed given the, the development which we just discussed. That is to say, the regional tour of Hibiti. But he may still be interested in meeting Hibiti under some other convening, uh, mediating uh, a team, you know. Could it be Jeddah? Could it be the African Union or the United Nations? All these actors really need to rise up to the challenge of one of the main crises in the world in terms of its human rights and humanitarian costs, in terms of the risk it poses to regional security and international security. But none of them uh, so far have a clear strategy on how they are going to approach uh, peacemaking and stuff. They should really, you know, be answering this question, what next now that the possibility of a meeting under IGAD is seeming to, to you know, passing, uh, to, to be fleeing, uh, you know, escaping us, you know. And therefore, I'm calling on the international community to really get its act together, 
Jirab for the challenge. I mean that challenge and not abandon the people of Sudan while they are just, uh, you know, I don't know what they are doing in the face of this major crisis, except uh, issuing statements, you know, we haven't seen much action. Suleiman Baldo is the director of the Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker. He was speaking with us from the state of New Jersey, USA. Thousands of South Sudanese at Liri Refugee Camp in Sudan's western quarter fan are moving back home because of the conflict between the Sudan Armed Forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces. Authorities in Upper Nile State say the South Sudanese refugees have spent over eight months without food, water and medical supplies. Ibrahim Meme reports from Malakai. South Sudanese refugees at Liri Camp in Sudan's western Kordofan say they lack access to life-saving humanitarian assistance. Isaac Kir, the coordinator of South Sudanese refugees in Liri Refugee Camp, says the camp was cut off from aid workers when fighting erupted last April, leaving the refugees without food and water. People in Liri are in bad situation because they have not received food assistance since February 2023. When the conflict in Sudan started in April 2023, humanitarian corridors were closed. People are suffering due to lack of food and water. Last month, we asked NGO to provide the transport to the stranded refugee in Liri, but there's still no help. Kir says... Some children and elderly persons die daily at the camp, adding that the refugees are waiting for United Nations agencies to repatriate them to Tonga in Panyikang County. If you are a refugee and you don't have any food and you don't work eight months without food assistance and they don't have any work, that is why a lot of people are dying. Children and elderly are dying. We are waiting for the organization to come to take them from Liri to their areas. We are not able to give you the number, but daily two, three, four die. Gabriel Oloy, County Coordinator for South Sudan's Relief and Rehabilitation Commission, says some refugees lack the money for transportation and have traveled to Tonga on foot. Those who came, they are the people who are able, some come on footing with their children, those who can see themselves, they have effort to come. Some they are using motorbike, those who have a little money. But what they tell us a lot, it is a, a way of hiring some vehicle to use. It's difficult because there's no money. There is a much number of children because only we saw women carrying children, but we know that there are some children who are separated. Oloch says his office is mobilizing non-profit groups to help repatriate the refugees. He says the International Organization for Migration is well informed about the plight of the South Sudanese stranded in Sudan. ROC is still mobilizing the resources from uh, NGOs like uh, IOM. Even the time we went for rough assessment, IOM was there with us. And uh, through interview, they get all the information that people want to come back because life is too hot for them and there's no way to let them come. They say they are going also to send the message and they are going to mobilize. But now, due to the Christmas in, we didn't get more information how far they reached. The camp in Liri was opened after the outbreak of South Sudan's 2013 conflict. Oloch says many people fled on foot to western Kordofan to seek refuge. Panyikang County authorities say 1,408 refugees from Liri camp arrived in Tonga this week. For VOA News, I am Amir Abram Court in Malakal. If the National Council for Higher Education denies allegations that Uganda may face Nigeria's rejection of its degree certificate over authenticity concerns. Professor Mary Okwakol, National Council for Higher Education, is ed- Executive Director, clarified that there have been no complaints from Nigeria about the legitimacy of Ugandan academic papers. National Council for Higher Education investigates complaints related to higher learning institutions and takes appropriate action. Contrary to reports, Nigeria has not suspended accreditation for Ugandan degrees. Professor Okwakol urged anyone with evidence of fake degrees to provide information for necessary action. Educationist Rose Stella Akwakol 
Akongo cautioned against obtaining degrees in under two months, urging vigilancy against substandard courses. The Ministry of Education refrained from commenting until formal education is received. Last year, a Ugandan student faced challenges in a UK university due to an alleged expired undergraduate course. National Council for Higher Education directed universities to submit programs for review, with 2,395 out of 4,369 accredited degree programs in the final stages. Makero University investigated fake degree awards, urging employers to re-verify degrees. Chambaga University's Vice Chancellor Professor Erika Tunguka prayed to revoke degrees obtained fraudulently. Some Ugandans were reported using genuine academic documents that did not belong to them. Boeing finds itself grappling with renewed safety concerns as federal authorities announce a temporary grounding of select Boeing 737 MAX planes following a distressing incident involving an Alaska Airlines jetliner. The Federal Aviation Administration has issued an emergency order mandating immediate inspections for some MAX 9 planes impacting a global fleet of approximately 171 aircraft. This development compounds the challenges facing Boeing given the history of two fatal clashes involving its MAX lineup in the most recent incident. An Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 9 experienced a, fu a fuselage panel blockout shortly after takeoff, resulting in a swift loss of cabin pressure. While remarkably, no injuries were reported. The FAA's emergency order intensifies scrutiny on the safety of Boeing's best selling plane, raising concerns within the aviation industry. The repercussions of this safety directive are palpable for Alaska Airlines, which had to cancel 141 flights, accounting to 20% of its scheduled departures on Monday.